Hi, I'm Phil Lamar. And I want to welcome you to Tuned In with Jim Cummings. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today. Welcome to Tuned In with Jim Cummings. And we have today no one else, but why am I looking over there? <laughs> the one and only Phil Lamar. Welcome, man. It's good to see you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Like, uh, I mean, there's nothing better than being interviewed by somebody you love. Oh, man, thanks. <laughs> well, there's nothing better than interviewing someone you do love. <laughs> and, and I mean that sincerely in the best showbiz tradition. <laughs> but, uh, man, thanks for coming out here. It's a schlep <laughs> from your, your mansion in, in uh, <laughs> North Hollywood out to my little humble bungalow. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, before we leave, we're going to have to try and get a picture of the wall. Because there is some significant... <laughs> See, that's known as a teaser. We're not doing it right now. We're going to wait for a few minutes. Exactly. How am I doing, Brendan? You're doing great. <laughs> he doesn't know He doesn't know what the wall is. Right, yet. right, right. He's going, he yeah, 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 okay, good, sure, yeah. Wink, I'll, wink. You've got a wall. That's good, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Jim did his own painting. He likes people to see Yeah, it. yes, he did. Uh, yes. Well, uh, like I say, welcome again. It's great to see you here. And, uh, you know, on the way, on the way home, I was trying to think when you and I first met and, uh, it's been a little while now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, and I'm going to say Ozzy and Drix. Could Ooh. it be? Yeah, that could have been that. Could have been mean, that. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. Cause I mean, we've, you know, crossed paths so many oh, times. Yeah. I'm like, wait, but when was the first one? Mm -hmm. Was it in the lobby of the agency? Yeah, it could or be. Was it at a that's job? true. That's true. But well, a job wise. Right. Well, yeah. Also, the tough thing is these uh, COVID years yeah. have messed up my memory because oh. everything before COVID feels like it was 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's, I met Jim 40 years ago. No, yeah. no, that's not right. And stuff, yeah, this, even the stuff that's 20 years old, it seems like it's 20 years ago. <laughs> so that'll throw you right there. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I bet you that, yeah, guessing on Ozzy and Drix, over at uh, when Warner Brothers was mm -hmm. in, there in the mall. It was there in the mall. Yes, <laughs> that was interesting. Yeah, good times. Yeah. I, I wish they would bat be coming back. So when, when you say in the mall, what do you mean was in the mall? Just the studio or? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. The, the recording studio for um, Kids WB mm -hmm. was in a mall. Big and shopping mall. Yeah, yeah. The, the Sherman Oaks Galleria that you know, yeah. was big in the 80s. That was a big thing. Um, although... The one bad thing about the, the mall, it wasn't a bad thing about the mall, but it, a mistake I made one time, because I realized that down the way from the studio, there was, you know, Burke Williams massage. Like, oh, and I had an afternoon session. Like, why don't I go get a massage before the session? Then I'll be all relaxed. and Yes. Uh-huh. But and I forgot that did. when you get a massage, that's like going to sleep. So oh. I walked into the session oh. as if I had just woken up. I'm like, oh, I can't do Oh, yeah. I got to do high, high voices. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to sound like Chris Rock. <clears throat> I thought you were going to say it was not that kind of massage. Because <laughs> that, that could have invigorated you. <laughs> oh, hey, I'm ready to go. Right, right. <laughs> you know, that kind of massage, I would have had a big range. Yeah, that would have, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you never know. I had to ask. <laughs> All right, we got that cleared up, ladies oh, and gentlemen. Yes. Oh, man. So, and now how long have you been doing animation? Um, well, that's a trick question. Oh, uh, well, good. Because there are two answers. Oh, okay. One, since 1996, when on Mad TV, mm -hmm. they started doing yeah. these claymation pieces. Oh, and okay, yeah, guy, yeah, I remember that. There was this guy, Corky Quakenbush, who did these super funny things. And then, because the cast was already getting paid for the episodes, they had us voice the, the animated sure, characters. Sure, yeah, yeah. And um, that's how I started getting my mic time. I'm like, oh, nice. Oh. And then, after a couple of years of that, I thought, you know what? I like doing that. Maybe yeah. I should go pursue this voice acting. Yeah, thing. yeah. No makeup, even. Right. Costume. Exactly. Don't have to wear a wig, you don't sweat. Yeah, <laughs> um, and and I got super lucky because the casting women who cast us on Mad TV mm -hmm. turned out to be the people casting Futurama. Oh, and so they got me and Dave Herman in the room. Say no across more across from Matt Groening. 
And That's cool. Yeah. So that was good luck. Wow. But the weird thing was that actually wasn't my first time doing animation. Uh oh. Okay. Because junior year of high school, my um, my mom had a friend who was an exec at NBC. Nobody likes a braggart. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dude. That's no. That's amazing, man. High yeah, school. High school. And I think my mom had dragged this woman to um, you know plays that I did in high school. And so they were doing a cartoon oh, wow. where they were actually having kids do kids' voices back in the 80s, yes. which, which was a rarity back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. And she said, hey, Phil, why don't you come audition for this? And I wound up getting a job on an NBC Saturday morning cartoon, The Mr. T Show. No way. Oh, yes. And Yes. Yeah. Although back then, voice acting wasn't a phrase. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah. It wasn't something that you would consider as a career path. It was like, no, I just had this cool summer job. Wow, no kidding. So you didn't have to pity the fool or anything. Right. <laughs> yeah. You just went straight to the and sadly, to the hammer. Even for three seasons, I never met Mr. T once. Oh, really? Still, to that this was day. my next question. To this day, I oh, never. Oh man. Met him. Well, that makes both of us. Yeah. Right. I can't believe he's been avoiding us. This. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Something I didn't say. It's because neither one of us has a mohawk. That, well, that's true. That's, I'm getting there. Uh, I'm getting there. Un involuntarily. Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. Well, you've had as bodacious a career on camera as off camera as off camera as on camera. You, I mean, you are, I don't know many people whose list of off camera, on camera credits are, are fighting like that. So that's a beautiful thing. I'm, I, I've been very, very lucky. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, so have we. Yeah. Good night, everybody. That was a <laughs> that was a pretty good ending line. We, I'm gonna save that for later. Can we cut that out and use it later? <laughs> uh, Fix it in editing. Yes, yes, yes. Oh man. Well, what do you think, there, Brendan? I, th I think we should keep going. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> he said, "No, I'm, I'm enjoying being in the audience." Getting back to your Futurama, though, like let's talk about um, Hermes because that's where I was first introduced to you. I mean, I. I may have watched Marvin back when I was a kid when I wasn't supposed to, but my first proper introduction was, was Hermes when I was um when I was a bit older. And I found it incredible that he wasn't originally Jamaican. That was something that Matt Groening pitched to you. So now that, you know, you, of all the controversy that's come out with the, you know, a particular race should voice a particular race of that character, would you have agreed to do a Jamaican accent at that point, knowing now what you know now with the way people react to, say, for example, it should be a Jamaican actor doing that, for example? <laughs> oh well i mean look that whole like 2020 controversy yeah you know it's one thing to go back to the old days when nobody ever thought about representation but mm -hmm. the big thing they gotta you know straighten out is it's not about authenticity acting mm -hmm. is about making yeah. fiction real right i mean what you ain't never gonna cast nobody but somebody who's actual Danish royalty to play Hamlet? Yeah. That don't make no sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, apparently Clint Eastwood isn't a real cop. <laughs> exactly. I, I've heard the rumor. It's an ugly rumor, but it's true. <laughs> no, yeah. no. I mean, it's it's funny because, you know, I've had this conversation with a lot of people. No, there's, it's about the principle. Any actor should be able to play any role yeah. they can believably portray. Mm -hmm. But there's also, and especially back in the old days, there's this sort of, you know, pragmatic element where, you know, it's like, well, no, no. Cast somebody, you know, of a different color to play a different, just so you can make yeah, a living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because back in the 80s and 90s, you know, there were so few characters of color that mm -hmm. if you didn't get cast, because, you know, because, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the color of sure. the character doesn't matter. No. The color of the actor, but you know, for, and back in the old days, they wouldn't bring you in, mm -hmm. you know, as a woman or a person of color or something, yeah, unless the character looked like you, which mm -hmm. didn't make no sense, no, but no, you know, um, especially but for nowadays animation. that there's much more diversity in mm -hmm. the different shows and in the char characters, you don't need everybody to be. You know, what other one? What you what you you got to cast rabbits to play Bugs Bunny? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. That's true. That's very true. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to put it, because it's like you can only just be so diverse, and then you're shooting yourself in the foot. You know, it's not the 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 end product should be a good product, 
not we touched all the right bases. Mm -hmm. Well, but, and actually, what's more important than the diversity of the actors is the diversity of the people making decisions. Because the thing is, if they're casting a Jamaican character, and then the people who decide from the auditions don't know nobody Jamaican, can't tell which accent is good. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's like, so, but if you have good writers, mm -hmm. you know, regardless, yeah, that's, that's regardless of what their yeah. background is, they yeah. go d they dig deep into what makes the character work best. Yeah. Which is actually why Hermes got turned into Jamaican. Because mm. they realized that would make him more interesting. Because yeah. originally, was, by that, he was yeah. just a dumpy accountant, bureaucrat type character named Dexter. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. But, you know, I remember Matt going, oh, dang it. I think I have too many characters whose names end in ER. Homer, oh. Bender, Dexter. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's a hazard. But then I think the writers got together and they thought, you know what might be funny? Is if we were able to take, you know, sort of Jamaican cultural stuff and lay that into that accountant character. Because <laughs> nobody had ever seen that before. No. Like, no. a cool Caribbean bureaucrat. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. You know? So that gave them more to work with. Yes, it did. As opposed to, I am the bureaucrat yeah, of yeah. Planet Express. Everybody been do everybody's seen that character before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, that was a good bureaucrat, though. <laughs> no, I got to I got to give it to you. I'd love I'd love to go back to when you first auditioned for the role of Hermes because obviously you're still on Mad TV at the time you said it was the same people so you sort of had an in there but you know the Simpsons were still peak of the animation world at that point. How nerve-wracking was it going knowing you're going to be auditioning for Matt Groening? It was pretty like I mean in your head it's intimidating mm -hmm. but then you walk into the room and the guy's energy is so nice. Yeah, and he's some guy. That it that it comes back it's like oh Okay, he's not looking at me like he's gonna step on me. Right, right. Yeah, he's smiling and saying hi, welcome. You know, but yeah, the fact that it's somebody that big. It's like, yeah. Oh my God, this guy changed the culture of the world so much. He had to yeah. change his son's name because you <laughs> yeah, couldn't yeah. be an eight-year-old boy in America named Homer. <laughs> oh, ooh, his his. You're kidding. His name. His son's name was Homer. Yeah. Because it's, the, the, the character Homer was named after Matt's oh, dad. Oh, I see. And his son was named after his dad. Ooh. But then there came, it's like, Dad, I can't go to school anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, Abe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they kept trying to paint him yellow. So that, <laughs> that's, that's not right. <laughs> dad, yeah. And I have an overbite. <laughs> oh, God. God bless him. How did, how did they pitch Futurama to you? What, what was there? Because they couldn't reveal too much. But what was the... What, what idea in your mind did you have? What did they create for you to sort of create the Hermes voice and just the show in general? Did you have any idea of what you were auditioning for? Was it just a, a show that the same guy that The Simpsons made? Well, I mean, all we knew is that it was the next show by the creator mm -hmm. of The Simpsons, but they, yeah. they give us the, you know, explanations. Like, yeah, it's, all it's, you need set, to know. it's set in the year 3000, and, you know, it's a thousand years from now. And, you know, they give you the premise. So, like, there's a guy from now who gets frozen for a mm -hmm. thousand years and then winds up in the future. So it's, yeah. you know... You realize it's a sci-fi comedy, mm -hmm. but for the audition, you're really more focused on what the character is. It's like, oh, oh this, yeah, oh, this guy is, uh, you know, in the in the future, every business must have a certified bureaucrat to make sure that all the paper gets done. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. That's good. That's so, perfect. Yeah. So that's that's what uh, you know I was focused on, and. Um, and apparently they liked what I did. It was definitely yeah. easier than, you know, having to do the voice of Bender. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember auditioning for that. Oh, you, yeah. oh, you went in that? Of course you did. Yeah. I, 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 I think it was just for Bender. And, it's, and it was always kind of funny because I used to do this guy named, um, uh, gosh, what was his name? He was on Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. And I think it was Snively or uh, anyway, it was, uh, he was a cop. And he sounded like this. <laughs> And God rest her soul, it was my Aunt Grace. It was a really good impression of my Aunt Grace. Nice. And, you know, she just sounded like that. Well, everybody in audience, audience kids, come on, pick up the plates here. Help your mothers, for Christ's sake. Everything was, we're very religious home. Everything was for the sake of our oh Lord. Oh, my God. And, uh, I love and that I, voice, and I, and, I, and, I, and Bender's not quite there. 
But, but close. They're, they're brothers. Oh, yeah, definitely. Dude, I, what you, the hell, man? You, you know? can call John DiMaggio's wife with that voice. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm not saying he did. I'm not saying. Yeah, I'm not. I didn't. I hardly ever. Uh, I never. I never did. That. I, never, I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, so where were we? As in, not there. Right, Who do, do, anyway. you, do you look for you look for family for inspiration too, don't you, Phil? Because you had, I believe it was Green Lantern was an homage to your dad's smoky voice, right? Well, yes, because um, well, when I went to audition for Justice League, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a big old comic book guy. Oh, me too. And um, I just came from the comic book. Store. I know you had a stack, and um, but they were not using the you know main you know hal jordan green lantern like great mm -hmm. great but going into audition for green lantern you just go with the character and also the way bruce tim draws mm -hmm. all of the characters have those enormous chests. chests yeah so yeah big shoulders you gotta have it and also the person who auditioned ahead of me was the actor dennis haysbert oh who had he walked in in a green shirt they would have thought the cartoon they, they character would have thought, was standing yeah, in front of him. Yeah, he's a cool dude. <laughs> and Dennis has... You know, I remember yes. looking at just like, dang, he's a live action version. Yeah, yeah. And his voice was in my head. Oh, yeah. And so you're doing a hero voice. <laughs> but then they described the characters. <laughs> That's pretty like, heroic. <laughs> yeah. And they described the characters like, well, John Stewart, he's you know, from Detroit, and he was a Marine. And I'm like, oh, well, let me... Just Not just do the yeah. hero voice. Because my dad was from Detroit. Yeah. And... His brother was a vet. Oh, okay. So I figured, well, an let, actual me, hero. let me just add a little bit of... So it's not just this. <laughs> no, it's just more of, a, more of a real man. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, John Stewart, Green Lantern of Sector 2814. I mean, I wasn't doing an impression of my yeah, dad, yeah, yeah. but I was trying to bring a little bit of that energy. Sure. Okay. I was like, well, this is what a real guy might yeah. sound like. As, yeah, yeah. as opposed to just a cartoon yeah, character. Yeah, yes, that's right. Don't, 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 play, don't voice the suit. Voice the person. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I hope you guys are writing that down out there, right? <laughs> Phil just gave that's a, a little gem right there. And I always, th another thing that I'm thinking of referring to your family is if you do a perfect impression of, like I say, my Aunt Grace, nobody knows her. That's a new character. Exactly. So there you go. And it's also something that's deeply rooted. Yeah. You, know, you can always go back to it. You, exactly. You, you just family reunion 1982. You know, uh, <laughs> Over yeah. the potato salad, he said, <laughs> and you're there. That's wonderful. That is too cool. Mm -hmm. So what, what excites you more these days? Is it on camera or off camera? Um, well, actually, it's funny because people always ask me that. Well, which is your favorite? Oh, yeah. And what I've realized over these years is that it's not about the medium. It's about the quality. Yeah. You know, if you work on a good script with a good creator, you know, I mean, working on Samurai Jack mm -hmm. with yep. Andy Tartakovsky, that's to me the same experience as working on Pulp Fiction with Quentin Tarantino because you're working with a creative person and when you have great material, mm -hmm. it makes you a good actor. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. You know, there's another one we have to write down. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Oh, that's Life fantastic. lessons with Phil yeah. Lamont. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> yeah. and we've been very lucky mm -hmm. to work on really good quality stuff. Yeah, you know, I agree. I mean, you're doing Winnie the Pooh, a character that people have loved for a hundred years. You know. Yeah, just recently, I think he turned a hundred. <laughs> I really, I mean, he really did. I think yeah. from the from the book. But of course, we all know. Now we're going to say nothing, in, you know, particular. But yeah. we all have jobs that aren't necessarily great. <laughs> Wait, I I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, you know, because especially well because of the nature Ooh, of voice, okay, well, the fact maybe. that we can do two gigs in a day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Unlike those on-camera people. Yeah, you know, that's true. Not every show is an iconic. Yeah. Oh. Thing. Sometimes you just do a little guest on a little show and mm -hmm. it's get canceled after one season. Yeah. So you saw the snorks, is what you're saying. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> right. That was one of my first gigs. Yeah. I mean, it, was... it can still be fun if you're working with nice people. Oh, yeah. Cause, oh, yeah. Because I believe that the voiceover mm -hmm. is the kindest corner of show business. Yeah, I'll buy that. You know, it's like a village. You know, everybody it feels like a community, much more so than the movie world. 
the on camera. Mm. Oh thing. yeah. You know, if you're working on one movie, there might be somebody else shooting a movie on the same you know lot. You don't hang out with those people. No, that's right. That's but right. But in voiceover, you run into people at yeah. the same studio. They're working on a different show, and you hang yeah. out in the, hang out in the parking lot or in the lobby. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, so true. So true. And my theory over the years has been that it's the the reason that the voiceover world is nicer than mm -hmm. a lot of parts of show business is because of the sense of community, but also because nobody's getting paid enough to put up with nastiness. Yeah, that's right. You know, because mo the vast majority of voiceover jobs are scale, mm -hmm. you know? Sure. But in the movie world, oh, that person's getting paid $20 million. Like, well, he's a heroin addict. Don't let her. Hire him anyway. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But in voiceover, yeah, but he's got a famous like, name. Right, but voiceover, it's a group record. You know, at least it was mm -hmm. back in sure the day. Sure, it was. Yeah. You know, you want a good vibe. Mm -hmm. So, and you have a lot of people who have that. Yeah. You know, and that's why it's all yeah. such a joy. and not not a ton of people who bring a big ego to the sessions. Exactly. That helps. You yeah. know, that really yeah. does help. Yeah. Because once every now and then you'll run into somebody, and I mean every now and then, like two or three times in my lifetime. Right. And uh, so it's very very rare. Because I'm sure between us, we work with thousands of people at this point. Yeah. You know, and I do, for the record, I miss the the, uh, the group sessions where we're everybody's sitting around and we're all in the same room. Yeah. And uh, I think COVID knocked that out. And, and I think a lot of people that had uh, sitcoms or whatever were starting to bleed into the, do a VO. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's just, you know, it just kind of got screwed up, screwed the pooch a little bit, muddied the water. Yeah. But, uh, you know, yeah, someday. I, I mean, because, yeah, when I started out in VO, everything was a group record. Sure. But then Me too. In the last few years prior to COVID, more and more sessions started being it's just you recording, which you can do. Yeah. But it's tougher. I agree. I mean, it's always easier to yeah. be able to perform a scene with other actors. Yes. I mean, this Not like vacuum, this recording by yourself. I always think of it as like, well, if I was an on camera actor and they're like, yeah, yeah. When you go home, shoot your close-ups. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, let me do that for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I've done a lot of shark weeks, and that's just me talking. We see Felipe going beneath the waves. Will he return? Felipe's screwed. He, he's not coming. So those you can do all by yourself. Absolutely. And, of course, Felipe. But, uh, you know, but other than that, it's nice to have somebody to bounce off. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah, sometimes you know, like when you're there are scenes where you're doing alone, or you're doing a monologue, or you're doing narration. You don't need another person. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a need; it's a want. Well, it's a yeah, you bet. And it makes it better. Mm -hmm. And it's not like cartoons uh, have gotten worse since yeah. they stopped doing group records. No. Oh yeah. It just means they spend more time editing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're right. Jim, give you're us right. Give us take twenty five. Yes. <laughs> I did that today. <laughs> Oh, wow. And you know yeah. that some poor guy has to sit there and listen to all 25 of your takes and yeah. all 25 of the other three characters in the scene. <laughs> yeah. Let me put this with this. Let me yeah, put this with that. I can't that. imagine. That. I cannot imagine. Ugh. I don't have that kind of head or brain right? or anything. No way. Yeah. Yeah. I hope they all, I think they should all get a raise. <laughs> okay. There. Yeah. We, we just, <laughs> and you're welcome. Damn you. Just, just kidding. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Can compare the energy of the Mad TV ensemble with when you joined Futurama. Was there similarities there? Do you think because you worked with that ensemble already, it helped you with Futurama with the with the rest of the crew? Um, well, I mean, you know, having come up doing improv and sketch, you know, yeah, you just you know take the benefit of a group work. But yeah. walking into a studio with Billy West and Tress McNeil and Maurice mm -hmm. Lamarche and mm -hmm. Katie Segal, yeah, that's like getting drafted onto the show. Sure. You know, <laughs> Chicago Bulls in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the 80s. Time to move. I'll, and it's funny because I remember the first session of Futurama, there was a scene where Billy, who's voicing three different characters, mm -hmm. there's one scene where one of his characters introduces another character to his third character. And oh, he that's did the great. The whole scene alone. Yeah, yeah. On the run. And I was just like, oh. <gasps> yeah. Oh, my God. So it, it, it gave me the bar for like, 
Someday I got to learn how to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations. You've, yeah. you've done it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 20 years later. Yeah. And Chris had something. Yeah, we've, we've been talking about on camera. We've been talking about voiceover. And this is still voiceover. But how do you feel about performing in video games? I know you've done Mortal Kombat, which I was surprised to see. And you've done quite a few, mm. quite a few video games. How does that differ? Well, the difference about you know doing voice work for video games is... Unless you're working with a talented director, it can't. In general, it's a little more difficult, yeah. because you know, one, it's a lot more work, yeah. but you don't get a whole script, you don't get as much context. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times they just give you like an Excel with all, line, 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 line. So, right. and I mean, the good directors tell you the context. Yeah. Okay, no, for this line, you're going to be doing this, and, and they explain it to you. You know, but sometimes. The, good, the ones who aren't that good, don't. Just give me one more. Faster. Go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah better. More talent. Because like, I'm like, well, <laughs> wait, what is this line for? It's like, I don't know. We'll figure out later. Yeah. What was, your, what was your experience like working on Mortal Kombat 1? I know that just came out. And there was like a very cinematic storyline to that. You know, it was... Well, actually, the Mortal Kombat games are on the higher end. Because even though it's just, you know, a violent fighting game they focus on the characters, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, that's good. In a way that a lot of games don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of games like, yeah, yeah, okay, you done saying your, your word lines? Okay, now we're going to the important part, the screams. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're gonna do we about save, two hours of you dying. Save those to the end. <laughs> right. Yeah, boy, I agree. Okay, now get you electrocuted. Short, medium, long. Yeah. But, um, but for Mortal Kombat, they have plots they have relationships mm -hmm. and um dominic Ciancolo, who is the director for most of the mortal kombat stuff and the writer he knows how to direct oh good so you you feel like you're performing as opposed to just reading lines you know which some games i think that's all they think of you know yeah they're just treading water a lot of a lot of the video game companies just think of everybody as just you know cogs in the machine yeah yeah you know, whatever, just put it all together. Yeah. Um, Spackle it together here. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, for, I mean, I had it a little easier because I had played video games growing up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can look at a line and realize, oh, okay, this is, you know, coaching the player to know what they're going to do in the next, you know, thing. So you know how to get that line out there because you know what it's for. But if you don't play that game, it's like, yeah. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. Sure. All right, I'll just do the voice. There you go. Well, I had a Space Invaders, and I learned nothing from it. <laughs> so I, you oh got to get God. the right game. You got to use. You got to play the right. That game. was the pinball machine. It right? was a pinball machine. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't think I have any voice yeah, in a yeah, Space yeah, Invaders. Yeah, no, I know. That's why I was so <laughs> ill prepared. Right. See, I just I was able to stand there and go. Bing, bing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just not the same. Nope, not. <laughs> well. Yeah, yeah, and waka 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 waka. <laughs> name, <laughs> name that sound effect, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh that's God. that's painful. Well, like before, I was in the business. I, I can't believe I'm telling anybody this, but I had a stand-up Donkey Kong and a stand-up huh? Space Invaders, and no I would I would put them in pizza parlors for like six months, <laughs> and then you kind of give the guy a ten ten dollar ten percent commission, and then you go there like once a week and you dump it, and you have all these great quarters. Nice. So I made dozens and dozens of dollars. Oh my God! Was that out here or was that back? Uh, in, no, back it was in here. Ohio? Yeah, oh. at, in uh, Anaheim. All right, right on. I, I think it was Anaheim. That's I, amazing. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. I was but a lad. I love that. At one point, you were outside the video game. Now you're inside. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah, that's that's very true. Yeah, I haven't done many video games, but I was Sarge. Sarge, no, the arm army men. Sarge's army men. Sarge's heroes, right? Sarge's heroes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, and one that everybody. I can't believe it. I did this 25 years ago, and it was. Um, oh gosh. Baldur's Gate. Baldur's Gate. Is it Baldur's? Thank oh. you. Yeah, right. go for the ice, boo. And, and I was some big Norwegian goof. Uh -huh. And he, he was basically Lenny in of Mice and Men. And instead of a, a, a gerbil, it was, the hamster of justice, boo, will get you now. So, uh, okay, but enough about him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, painful. the video game thing is actually a little easier when mm -hmm. it's a character from 
a show yeah. that you've done. It's like, oh, now we're doing a video game version. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's true. Like, did they ever take your Star Wars character into a video game? Um, no, Is he Hondo? no, no. But he's he's, he's a, in the movie. These two big giant. Yeah, he's uh, he's in these two big giant. Uh, almost video game rides at mm -hmm. Disneyland, Disney World. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I steal the Millennium Falcon about 500 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> and I conned Chewbacca into helping me. Nice! Kaboom. What, uh. what was the recording process for those animatronics? What was that like? Was it just like regular VO? Kind of, yeah, 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 it was. I, I'll never forget, uh, 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 they, they brought me in over at uh, uh, Disney Im Imagineering, which is a slightly, it's a, offshoot obviously of off of uh disney's lot and uh so these guys are walking me through and they're and they've got this thing for hondo and they've got big pla like it was the movie it was oh, uh, just wow. like with with a movie boy, where you see like you know spielberg and everybody these big kind of like that uh big stills of of this game and and they've got they're doing and they're walking at room after room after room and then you go from here, and then you then then if if you make it through, you get to hop on the Millennium Falcon, and then you go blah 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 blah, and then you and I go, I go man, this is a lot of game of stuff to do on spec. How 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 are you? Uh, and I realized they were pitching me, and I, and I, it was like, <laughs> you don't think I want to do it? I mean. <laughs> I mean, I would almost okay. I wouldn't pay to do it, but I would take your money to do it. And then, and they would go. But would this be something you'd be interested in? And I go, gee, let me think. Hell yes. <laughs> you know what are you? Are yeah, you what are you going to turn down? It's yeah, like, no. You know what? No, no. Change that third line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the biggest ride in Disney World and yeah. Disneyville, and uh, and I said, yeah, that that's okay. Sure. <laughs> You know, and now, uh, you know, all my friends and nieces, nephews, they go, Aww. we really like your ride. <laughs> Thank you. What What are we talking about? Because they recognize that voice. Oh, well, yeah, I guess. Even though so, it's, I mean. It's a little weird. Yeah, it's not you talking like no, you. He's Charles okay. Bronson and Yul Brenner. Right. You you ever do that? Put together <laughs> yeah. two, two people? Mm-hmm. You know, oh, that's, it's just fun stuff. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and you have worked with a lot of interesting people and now help me out because I want to know speaking of interesting people God rest his soul your buddy Pee Wee Herman yeah. the one and only yes mm. well a lot of people don't know that you were the live action Cow Cowboy Curtis were you not I on, well or what, I was, I was live the, I was the on stage on Cowboy stage Curtis. there we go okay that's yeah. what I well, yeah. you were live at the time. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, originally, Paul first did Pee Wee Herman as this midnight show at the Roxy. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So back in what was it eighty uh, one? Yeah, they did a, a stage version, and it was such a hit. Like people were lined up for yeah. a midnight show, and that's how he got the um, the the thing bought as uh, for the for the. Um, Wait, was it the movie or the TV show? The came first? movie to the TV first. show, yeah. Uh, you know, and it blew up. Yeah. But, you know, That's then for sure. later, you know, 30 years later, he decided to restage the original, um, you know, stage show. Mm -hmm. But there was all of this stuff that he had created for the Saturday morning show. Because the original show, he was just doing it at the ground. Like, yeah, he yeah. He didn't have a big budget. He didn't have enough budget to hire puppeteers and all Cherry of this and all the rest of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he wrote all of that into the original, mm -hmm. the, the original show that he had co-written with Phil Hartman. Yes. And because Phil Hartman had passed away, yeah. he took Phil's character, Captain Carl, and, that was in the original stage version, and replaced him with Lawrence Fishburne's character from the Saturday Morning Show, Cowboy Curtis. Yeah. So it was the same plot, but now it was Cowboy Curtis who was in love with Miss Yvonne. Yes, I remember. You know, I like, I really like. And, yeah. <laughs> but apparently, you know, when we, they were doing it in 2010, Lawrence Fishburne was a little busy. So he couldn't come well, to a stage play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, good for him. No, I'm starring and producing Blackish. Yes, yeah. And so, a little busy. And so Paul said, hey, Phil, will you come audition 
because Paul and I had done um, a comedy show on stage at the Groundlings because you know he had been in the Groundlings for years before me and I'd been in Groundlings in the 90s and that's where we got to meet. And then because I got to meet this incredible genius guy who was you know had a character that was basically like the human Mickey Mouse. Yeah, generations yeah. of yeah. people who just like love that character. Good way to put it. Um, I got to do Broadway because Paul was my wow. friend. And he said, okay, we did the show in LA. It's like, hey guys, guess what? We're moving it to New York in the fall. And that was a joy. Wow. What I mean, because a... that character was so like popular yeah. that the people who showed up <laughs> after each performance, mm -hmm. you know, to come say hi to Paul in his dressing room. Oh yeah. That list Ooh. would blow your mind. I remember after the show, I come backstage and I look up and there's, Lou Reed and the author Salman Rushdie walking together down a thing like oh man heck? and another those two knuckleheads right together oh man wow another time there was you know David Duchovny and Taya Leone trying to get a picture with th their kids with Pee Wee oh, okay and while they're taking their picture Paul Simon is standing in line <laughs> waiting to take a picture with his kids Jesus wow. and another time David Bowie. Oh. And Iman were hanging out in Paul's oh. dressing room. I'm just, just like, hanging out in Paul's dressing room. Oh, oh. oh man. That, because that's, you know, a character that's that deeply, yeah. you know, heartfelt. Into the culture. To yeah. 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 Wow. It was crazy. I hardly ever run into those guys, you know? Right? I, mean, <laughs> I mean, almost never. Never. I must say. Oh, no, that, that was Ed Grimley. That was, that's yeah. the other. That was the anti Pee Wee. Never mind. Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> Cut that out. We don't. We don't want that. <laughs> but there's something that can be said for being a character that takes people back to their childhood. I mean, you guys both know that. Oh yeah. And now you know yeah, yeah, your yeah. cons are filled with these kind of people. But this that connection of reminding people of a happier time. You can just it's bank these days, isn't it? Oh God. Yeah. Very true. Well, you know, I, I do these cons, and you know, I'll throw a little Winnie the Pooh out to. These people, and all of a sudden, you, you see this forty-year-old, you usually a woman, go, do 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 do, and she's seven. Yes, she's seven on the spot. Mm -hmm. oh, I didn't know you could do. do what you have to do something? And I go, well, no, just say hello, you know. And and they they think they think there's a filter or there's something. And I go, you know, pull the string, you know, chatty yeah. Kathy. But yeah, it's a blessing, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, because I realize that there is something about the way voices from your childhood live in your head like your parents voice like you remember when you you know were a little kid and your parent your mom would say philip you know yep but when you're 40 and your mom says philip you hear it the same way yeah yeah <laughs> yeah like, well i know she ain't gonna spank me now but <laughs> yeah <laughs> but the thing oh, is man. it's still there in your head and cartoon characters are like that I remember oh, yeah. the first um, time I got to do a Scooby-Doo. Mm -hmm. And we were, you know, there at Warner Brothers. We did a read-through beforehand. Ruh row And it was funny because Tom Kenny was guesting and me and John DiMaggio. And for the read-through, um, Tom read Shaggy just in the script. He was just reading. Oh. And I was like, oh, wow, that's such a good Shaggy. Ooh, Casey Kasem better watch his back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then... You know, after we finished reading through the script, we went into the recording studio, and then Casey showed up. I think maybe he's been doing his radio show that morning. Probably, yeah. And so he goes on to the mic, and they're like, all right, Casey, uh, can you just uh, give us a couple lines uh, for, the, for the volume? And he starts doing the voice, but it's the real voice. Yes. I mean, Tom's was really good impression. Was really good, yeah. But all of a sudden... I heard my mom's voice. Oh, I, I heard yeah. the shaggy voice. Sure, sure. And I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand oh, up. Oh, that's great. And it, like you said, that lady thing. Yeah. I felt myself shrink. Yeah, yeah. Down to be a six-year-old with yeah, a bowl yeah, of cereal yeah. in my lap. <laughs> yes. Just hearing Casey do that voice. Yes. Because it lived in my head. Yeah. Because yeah. I'd grown up watching episodes of Scooby-Doo. Oh, sure, yeah. You know? Wow. That's so cool. And it was weird because I'm like, oh, oh my God, that shaggy is like, dude. You're not watching this at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're at work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go get on the mic. Oh, yeah. right, right, put the, right. Put the cereal down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. I've been very fortunate with a, with a lot of different things. I, I had something like that. I worked with Carol Channing, and she was sitting there making all this noise because she had too many 
uh, bracelets on and, and all this. And then she took those off and, and she was still moving around it, but she had some kind of linen, crinoline starched blouse and everything. And she said, Oh, don't worry, sweetie. I'll just take, don't worry. And she stands up and disrobes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she looks like this albino crow <laughs> Standing there with the bra, and she's got like a pound and a half of cotton under each bra strap. Oh, this is marvelous. I can move now, and nobody can tell I'm moving. Let's do the show. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, Okay, I'm just gonna look over here, right? You know, and and Warren, our, our uh, engineer, he had his little video camera, and 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 he, he looked at it and he goes. <laughs> yeah, let me put this down. <laughs> and he put it down. He he just he couldn't justify videoing it. Right. Oh man. Oh I'm, my god. So have you ever do, do you do that a lot? I mean, stand up. Take and, off a shirt. No, <laughs> you know, uh, no. I don't either. That's why I'm wearing this one. Doesn't well, make any sense. No, but it's funny because I remember you telling that story the first yeah. time. Yeah. And I think maybe that is the thing that made me think <laughs> about what shirt I wear what in a shirt recording I wear. session. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Get a gunny sack. Stick my head out. There you go. All right, ready to go. And scene. Right. Oh man. Don't wear that leather jacket. That's right. Yes. <laughs> but no, that, that is one of my jacket. most favorite yeah. VO stories. Yeah, it really is. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of them, don't we? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I'll bet you have a lot of them from <laughs> that little d drawing on the wall. <laughs> Would do I dare poke in poke that bear, so to speak? Do we? Do we does anybody what know what's this on drawing? this wall here this behind us here? Should oh, we? Can we see us? Oh, they can't see us in the in the wide shot. I'll I'll add an insert in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, okay. Good. Thanks. There you go. Yes. Yes. It's. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's 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 tough to look at. Is that uh, Pulp Fiction or? <laughs> yeah, poo, poo fiction. <laughs> poo fiction, right? It's poo fiction. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Well, that's where you I can get insert a copy that. Of this. Yes, you do. But yeah. make sure you put the right size. Right. Otherwise, <laughs> you get a, a billboard. Right, right. That ain't going to fit on a shirt. No. D describe the difference between, a, 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 a say, a Futurama fan or a Samurai Jack fan and a fan of someone who's like, oh, my God, I can't believe you are Marvin and Pulp Fiction. Because be, that's two different audiences a lot of the time, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's one of the wild things about the, you know, I've been very fortunate to work on a lot of, you know, great projects, but they don't all cross over. There's like some Futurama fans who don't even know I was in Pulp Fiction or whatever, mm. you know, you know, or a Mad TV fan that never watched Samurai Jack, you know, so it's all different demographics, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it's funny because sometimes you'll have, you'll be at a convention and you have, you know, different pictures of all the characters out on the table and someone goes, oh my God, I never knew that was your voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's okay. You don't need to watch everything at once. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. Well, Harry, then you should have this one. Mm -hmm. Although my favorite is when the generations come, and I'm sure you probably get this sometimes, oh, yeah. where there's like a kid who's a fan of one of your Star Wars characters, but their mom loves Winnie the Pooh. Oh, yeah. You know, so you get, you, you cross over. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, wow. You know, yeah. it's like somebody who, you know, watches Craig the Creek, but their mom Used to get up, stay up late to watch Mad TV. Oh, cool. You know. That's nice. Yeah, it's like, no, we'll no, take but, it. I, but I won't show that to my kids. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, right. that's smart, Mom. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that is. God, that's a great memory of the Mad TV stuff. That was good stuff. I mean, that was a damn good show. Yeah, well, I mean, but it wasn't a hit. I know? thought it was. See, I like weird stuff, though. Right, right. You know. Because so. back in the day, when it was before Fox was as big as it is yeah. now. So late night on Fox... Yeah, you're right was kind of like the low-end neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. You know, and everyone's like, yeah, you're not SNL. Well, th that's back when uh, there were three networks. Right. And there's, who are these people on Channel 11? You know. And <laughs> I know. Sometimes uh, you will know, be somewhere and it's like, yeah, I work on this uh, late night comedy show on Fox. Like, oh, Fox? No, no, we don't have cable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, no, no, it's a channel. Yeah, it's a yeah, <laughs> Channel Eleven. Okay, right. how about that? <laughs> but now, depending on where you, you live, know, well, and that's the big difference between the old days and now. Because in the old days, if you didn't watch a show when it aired, yeah. you didn't know about it. That's right. You know, you couldn't just go to a video store and 
get a tape of a show. Yeah, that's right. The way nowadays, it's like, well, I missed one episode of this thing in 1983. Let me go on YouTube. Here it is. Yeah. Like nowadays, oh, wait. no, I didn't. I got it right here. Ever worked on? Somebody can just see. And then sometimes they'll, they'll come up and they'll, that's like I said earlier. Do the voice. Do the voice. <laughs> and you go through three or four, and they go, No, not that one. Remember the postman <laughs> in the third episode of The Mask? I think it was from Sweden. Do the voice. I go, oh, yeah, they do, 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 do. that's it, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You sound just like him. <laughs> well, it was a three, I, I had three lines, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm lucky right, to remember. 20 years ago. No, I don't yeah. remember them. <laughs> yeah, are hard to believe. But Like, dude, I didn't memorize the script 20 years ago. Yeah. You think I'm going to have it still memorized now? I wouldn't have known it the next day. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah, but it's good stuff. Yeah. So where do you go from here? What's is there anything new we should know about it? I mean, even conventions and stuff, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, I mean I've been doing a lot of those. I guess COVID's over. Yeah. We're allowed to get out of the house. I'm knocking on wood when I say that. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of um, uh, conventions, my next uh, one is uh, Rhode Island Comic Con. Have you? Oh yeah, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna go there. Yeah. Oh great, I'll see yeah. you there. That's good, right. good, good. Yeah, that's gonna be fun. Um, although, well, good. Now it's on a weekend. Um, as far as what's next, now that the Writers Guild strike is over, um, there may be a next step, although I'm not exactly sure when, because this year, 2023, a big life change happened. Um, in the beginning of the year, out of nowhere, an old buddy of mine who I used to act with 20 years ago, he's since become a showrunner, mm. uh, Michael Malley. Okay. And... He called me out of nowhere. He's like, hey, I'm working on this new show, and I'd love for you to be one of my writers. So I took wow. a professional sitcom writing job. Wow. On a sitcom starring uh, John Cryer, mm -hmm. Donald Faison, oh. and Abigail Spencer. Because I love, I knew John and Donald. I'm like, oh, yeah? Oh, dang it. I love those guys. Yeah, I'll be on your show. Of course, forgetting after doing sitcoms for 30 years, like, dude. The writers don't hang out with the actors. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> like, oh, right. I forgot. Oh, yeah, never mind. I don't know any of the sitcom writers that I worked on shows with. No, that's true. <laughs> yeah. But it was wild to suddenly be on this other side of the sitcom world. That's it's, great. I've been on sitcoms since, you know, the yeah. early 90s. Yeah. And this was an old-fashioned multicam sitcom. We performed, you know, they performed in front of audiences. And, no kidding. Yeah. And John Cryer is a genius. Wow. You know, and Donald was amazing. And Abigail was wonderful. They were all so fun. And I realized, you know, I'd had this experience, you know, from the actor side mm -hmm. where the writers go, thank you so much. Because you realize as a writer, you type up some words. Yeah. But then when good actors yeah. perform it, yeah. it makes your writing look great. Yeah. And if you have an ad lib that's better than their line, right. they're even smarter. And they get, yeah, because the writer gets credit for your ad lib. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what, what was that process like to, to find the writing process for a sitcom? It was, it was interesting because I had not, you know, as an actor, when you're reading a sitcom scene, you don't think about the act structure of the episode. No, I just think about what I'm doing and what, what props I pick up. No, no, no. Yeah. You got to yeah. think about the scene. You got to, what are the beats? You know, uh -huh. where, is it, where is it going to next? And then, you know, down the road of this, you know, season, what, what do you reference? Like, if you bring in, if you write in a character, like his mom, we're going to have to cast somebody. I'm like, oh, yeah, I never thought about that. Mm. So, yeah, it made me think about episodes of a show in a completely different way for the first time yeah. in 40 years. Yeah, because you, you haven't had to. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't your job. Right. Now they're paying you. Okay, I'll do it. Right. So now I'm thinking it's like, oh wow, if I get you know cast as a guest spot on a sitcom now, am I going to go? Can I read the uh, three episodes before this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to. I want to have context. <laughs> Why? Yeah, yeah. Okay, scale plus ten. I don't know. Is that? <laughs> you know that, that's okay. Well, well, just for the first one. The second one, I get a little bump. <laughs> oh man. Is it very much you would write the script and then it's a team contribution after that? Is that how you sort of you would come up with an episode? So you'd write sort of the, the skeleton and then everyone gets together and adds in extra jokes? Or is it the whole no, no, process the, the, a team? The, the writing group is all together. Yeah. And you work together. It's like everybody throws out, oh, I think, what about, if this is an idea, this is an idea. And if people respond to it, then, or if the, the showrunner yeah. responds to it or sees 
uh, the good vibe Something from everybody happened. else. Yeah. You you put everything together. It's collaborative. And and if you get assigned a script, you write it up, but then the rest of the group will go through it and go, hey, Phil, what about this? Oh, I can add this line. What do you think if you add this and this? So everybody helps everybody, mm. you know? Yep. Um, wait, Chris, what was your That question? was nice. I was just asking if you've done a lot of writing before. Um, well, yeah, on Mad TV and, well, at the Groundlings, you know, when I came up in oh, my yeah. training, we were writing sketches. But that's just writing for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's all about yeah. just what I think is funny. Yeah. You know, or if you were in a liquor store and somebody in line is being really weird and dumb, like, if I get a wig that looks like that, I could write this as a sketch. Oh, yeah. Although the one experience I had as a writer um, where performers made my writing amazing was with this man right here. Because we did, um, we, were, we were still working on it to try I to remember. develop a show called Goblins. That was my next question. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering about that. There's a, there's a webcomic um, that my friend Ellipsis created um, that's set in the D&D &D world, but from the point of view of the monsters. Mm -hmm. Not just the warriors. Mm -hmm. And it's called Goblins, Life Through Their Eyes. And m my friend Matt King and I were trying to develop that into an animated show. And so we put together a, you know, a short version to try to you know, use that to sell it. And it was damn good, too, by the way. And we were lucky enough to get the most amazing voice actors. Jim and oh, Billy West stop it. and Maurice LaMarche and yeah. Jennifer Hale, Steve Bloom. And it was funny because... You know, I love the webcomic and Matt and mm -hmm. I, you know, as because Matt and I are both actors. So when we were writing it, we would act out all the scenes and think, OK, all right, I think this is going to go. But then when you guys performed mm. it, I was like, oh, oh, my God, uh, that's 78 times better than it was when we performed it. Maybe marginally so, but OK, <laughs> no, 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 I'll take it. You, you, you brought so much oh, good. Know, life and energy and fun to those characters like, yes. Well, God, Godspeed and break a finger. I know. I know. Or whatever you break when you're a writer. Yes. Hopefully now, <laughs> once all the strikes are over, we can get mm. goblins going. Yeah. Then we'll have another show to work together. We'll have another together. show to work together on. Okay. Write in. Who do, who do we tell everybody to write into? And, and write, you know, <laughs> <laughs> whoever you write in stuff like that to or text or whatever you do nowadays, Start do the it. Start petition. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Well, Why am I looking at the screen? Hopefully after that live action Dungeons and Dragons movies... Oh, well, maybe some yeah. people will now be more interested in getting mm. a cartoon. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, if we because you know how it is. Oh yeah. Once they realize, oh, there's an audience that likes that thing. Yeah, oh, let's, let's okay. Go get, let's go get some of them. Yeah, their their money's good. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can make money off them. Right. Futurama's been rebooted what three, four times these days. Yes, we are back from the dead for the fourth time. We yeah. are the zombie of animation. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, bother. Yeah. It's funny because I remember when we ended last time, you know, the showrunner was like, you know, we were doing the read through of the last episode. He's like, all right, everyone, welcome to the third last episode ever of oh, Futurama. Yeah. <laughs> last episode ever. That's cool. Well, at least they have a sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. Because you got to. And thank goodness they brought us all back. Because mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. time a show gets rebooted, oh, you never know. I know what you're gonna say. Yeah, what the new executives who just bought it, it's like, uh, yeah. no, let's uh, let's make it hipper, you know, or something. Yeah, or something. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. But but well, I think it's because we've all been through that. Yeah. Exactly. You some, they they replace people. It's like no, these voices of these characters live in the fans' heads. Yeah. You don't want to change. You don't want to change your mama's voice. Yeah, something like that, huh? I had an experience like that with uh, Christopher Robin, and um, I, I was always poo. Right. But uh, in the midst of someone's genius, they and I, I won't say the guy's name because that wouldn't be nice, but they had somebody else do Tigger. <gasps> yeah, they had somebody what? else do Tigger. I didn't know and that. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, and they they did it. Uh, you know, they they did it all, all the way. They did the whole movie. And uh, they animated mostly to him. And uh, I remember my daughter, uh, my third daughter, Gracie, and I, we went down to, this is years ago, obviously, uh, went down to see 
a, a rough cut. You know, it was about 75%, 70% done. And we're we're there, and we're watching it, and we're saying, oh, it's so cute. And, they, you know, and they've got the gray stuffies out there. They're not animated yet. They're not computer-generated, and they're all sitting around. It looks kind of funky and everything. And Tigger came on, and he sounded like uh, Rodney Dangerfield and, <laughs> and Jimmy Durante. I'm Tigger, all right? Hey, okay, forget about it. Pull my finger. I don't have one. Get out of here. You know, and it was it was just, and 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 she looks, she goes like this, and there were the three producers behind us, and we were the only people in the room, us two and them, and it was like we can't even pretend, you know, and and sure enough, you know, we went through it. A great movie, and, uh, and left her on the way home, and, and she looks at me, she goes, Daddy, you have to save Tigger. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. And then, then Mark Forster called two minutes later and said, Jim, I was sorry that I couldn't be there today. I had another appointment that popped up something I had to do. I think we should talk about Tigger. And I said, and, and <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so we Gracie. talked about Tigger. So anyway, so uh, we all got... See, Gracie would be a better executive yeah, than we, us. Yeah, we, we all have little, little <laughs> stories like that. I mean, recasting... Yeah. You, I mean, is oh. Tigger? I mean, recasting Tigger when they when they already have you? That's like <laughs> that's like pulling Michael Jordan out of the fourth quarter of yeah. a championship game. I was just gonna say that. It's like, okay, maybe yeah, Michael, was. Michael, go sit down. Go sit yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, you're good. You're good. <laughs> we don't want to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Devito, Danny, come here. <laughs> come here. Yeah, here we go. Right. <laughs> it's like no. That don't make no sense. No. Anyway, it all came out in the wash. But okay, at least at least their their exec you think shifted. Yeah, yeah the exec you think. There's a new term for you, everybody. That's good stuff, man. Yeah. Uh, How has it been getting back with the crew for Futurama? Because we spoke to Billy earlier in the year, and he said oh, he was loving the process. Yeah, yeah. Getting back to it is always great because it's such an amazingly talented and lovely group of actors, writers, artists. Producers and the thing is, you know, been doing a show since '98. Mm -hmm. You've gotten to know everybody, even like the animation directors. I mean, most shows, mm -hmm. yeah, you don't get to meet the animation directors. Mm -hmm. But over the years, you know, oh, we went to San Diego, Comic Con, mm -hmm. whatever. Oh, sure. So you definitely, we definitely feel like a family. That's so nice. Although it's funny because Lauren Tom pointed mm -hmm. out, it's like, oh my God, Phil, do you realize that when we started Futurama, many of us weren't married or didn't have kids yet. And now most of us have adults. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Like, wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And we've all shared mm -hmm. chunks of our lives together. Sure. And that's, sure. you know, I mean, it doesn't, every job you work on isn't necessarily, you know. Oh yeah. Joy. They're not all Futuramas. Right. That's but for sure. that one is great. Yeah. Nice. And Chris had something on his mind. Yeah, I just wanted to jump back to Pulp Fiction really quick and ask you about your your time on set and if you have any stories of John Travolta or Sam Jackson. I'm curious to know. Well, it actually, I got a couple of fun stories. Um, one, I have to say thank you to Julia Sweeney because um, Julia Sweeney, you know, is a you know groundling alum just like me, and she was on Saturday Night Live. And that is the reason I'm in Pulp Fiction. Oh, yeah? Because um, Harvey Keitel was host of SNL one time when yeah. Julia was still, and Quentin came with him to the taping, and Julia and Quentin met and became friends. And so then later, after Julia left Saturday Night Live and came back to LA, she was doing an improv show at the Groundlings, and she invited Quentin to come do it. So the first time I met him, we were doing an improv comedy show. He was actually good. Oh, you're wow. kidding. That's yeah. amazing. Well, of course he was. And so then when they were casting Pulp Fiction, like a year later, um, it's funny because the woman who was casting, Ronnie Yeskel, had cast me in an episode of L.A. Law, just some little bit part. Oh, yeah. And, you know, she, I heard this story later. She said, Quentin, uh, for the character of Marvin, um, there's a young actor, Phil Lamar, who I think would be good for. He's like, okay, okay, but, you know, there's this black guy at the Groundlings who I think would be great. Find him. Oh, no. <laughs> so I was really? competing with myself. Oh, man. Did you get the job? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But you also lost it. <laughs> yeah. See, that's wonderful. Yeah. 
And that's great. Just being able to audition for, I mean, that script yeah. was so great. Yeah. Because, I mean, oh, God. generally when you're auditioning for something, you're just whatever, whatever. Yeah. But like, after I read through it the second time, I had it memorized. No kidding. Because that's how well written Yeah, it was. yeah. Every line came naturally. Tweaked, yes. And so doing that audition felt like you were performing. And I got to read it with Quentin in it's the room. It's a great observation. Yeah. You know? And um, so then I got the part. And because that, that the, the quality of that script is how mm -hmm. he was able to make a movie with stars that big for only $8 million. Wow. Because wow. I bet you Bruce Willis, John, Sam Jackson, all those guys took a pay cut oh. just to be part of this. Wow. But also to save money, what Quentin did was he had rehearsals. Like it was a play. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So we yeah. went to the Stony Studio lot and they like, you know, had us act out our apartment scenes. So I remember mm. going out to Culver City and I walk in there and there's John Travolta, who I mm. grew up watching. Oh, yeah. And Samuel L. Jackson, who's amazing. Oh, wow. They just created an award for him at the Cannes Festival. And when I walk in, John goes, oh, wow. That's a kid I got to shoot. The audience is going to hate me. <laughs> yeah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the funny thing was, oh, I thought he was funny. just joking. Yeah. But he was. Well, I hated him. But I, he was, I, but he was I never could stand him. Because. <laughs> and he actually, they actually wound up changing the scene. Because there was a, originally the scene in the car where I'm riding in the back seat and Sam's driving and John reads from backwards to talk to me with his gun. He was supposed to shoot me twice. Oh. The gun is supposed to go off accidentally, hit me in the throat. And I was supposed to sit there, and then they decide, all right, let's let's put him out of his misery. I'm a, you know, I'm a oh, yeah, three yeah, and yeah. hit the hit the horn. One, two, three, and that's when they blast blood and it gets all over them. And they're like, oh, oh yeah. man, what are we gonna do? But John talked Quentin out of having it be two shots. Like, mm -hmm. no, Quentin, I can't kill him on purpose. Yeah. The audience is not gonna like the character then. Yeah, that's right. That's and not funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Quentin said, Oh, you're right. And so yeah. they, they changed it so it's now so it was just one shot. But yeah, John was so sweet. That's so nice. So fun. And I remember after the rehearsal, we went to lunch. It's this little, you know, um, what was it Dominican or Honduran restaurant in Culver mm. City or something? And the waitress, like, I don't even know if she spoke barely any English. Oh. But when she was serving our food, mm -hmm. she goes to Quentin's like, Burrito. She goes to Sam. Quesadilla. She goes, John. John Travolta. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Vinny Barbarino. <laughs> oh my God, that's how famous he is. Like, yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever village in yeah. whatever country she grew up in, yeah. everybody had Saturday Night Fever records. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, that's true. That's, I'll buy that. You know, that's yeah. how world famous that guy was. Yeah. But he was so sweet. He, uh, he wasn't like, stay away from me. Like, yeah. You know, because the, during the shoot, every Friday, you know, at the end of a shoot, all right, all right, we're going out to drinks. They would pass out flyers. This is where we're going to drink. And oh, John wow. would go out to the bar with everybody. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like, then he got, then he got, got 747 in your house. Yeah, in I was going to say, he got it. Then he got in his <laughs> he jet. He a bar. Yeah. It's like, nope. He wanted to hang out with the crew. Well, maybe he owned them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you never know. It might have been a, one of those Bill Gates kind of things. Or, <laughs> yeah. Pulp Fiction was that film that, that tended, it, it made John cool again, didn't it? Exactly. Because he, yeah. he was doing the look who's talking films and things like that, and then boom, he's now, you know, he's Vincent in yeah. Pulp Fiction. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and I think maybe Urban Cowboy gave him a little boost in there somehow. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I want to go, I want to talk about that tasty burger scene, right? So <laughs> That's were you there burger. when Samuel was just doing that big rant? Was he doing that in front of you or was that done by himself? No, no, that was that we were all in that room together. All in that room, yeah. Take us, look, take me into your mind in that moment because that's one of the most iconic scenes of all oh, time. Oh, I, I, I think I'll, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, actually, in my mind, I was taking a master class of acting mm -hmm. because you know before we shot the scene, we're off set, and Sam's just nice dude talking about his daughter or golf or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just you know whatever. Then when the cameras start rolling, I'm like. He yeah. went away. He went away. And yeah. all of a sudden, I looked over there, and I was looking into the eyes of a different human being. Mm -hmm. He had completely transformed. I'm like, oh. Okay, so damn. that's how you do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it's done. Yeah, because there was one point in the scene where, you know, in rehearsals, you know, I say, 
no, I think it's over there. It's like, I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. And then he was supposed to look back <laughs> yeah. to Frank Whaley's character. Yeah. But while we were shooting, the cameras are rolling. He said, I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. And he kept looking at me. And I felt actual scared. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is Sam actually mad at me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did I do something wrong? Yeah, you don't really want to get him pissed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even fake. Right. Even acting. It's not, ooh. Yeah, oh, that's, that's awesome. I mean, that, was, that, that taught me a lesson about, mm -hmm. okay, you got to be able to transform and let the camera feel that. Because mm. I could feel it in the room, yeah. but you could feel it through the camera too. It's like, damn. Yep, yep, yep. That's how good he is. Wow, man. Amen. Well, yeah. I think at one point was wait, where is it on the IMDb or what? What is that thing where you look up uh, the biggest box office stars of all times or something? And I think once he sunk all the way down to third. <laughs> you know, but it was well, it's people like I mean, well, because he's done so many movies. Yeah, 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 and and they've was, all was been, he behind Frank Welker? Uh, <laughs> Remember when Frank was high yes, on that list? Yes, I made it to eight. Nice. A long time ago, I was eight. I believe but it, but only because of you know I was, hey, look out, you know, and that was you know, and it was in Lion King or something, you know, and it was stupid stuff like that, but uh, but yeah, I remember that, mm -hmm. and uh, but Sam has always been, I mean, all the Star Wars, right? For bing, ding, 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 ding. What else is left? You know, right, yeah. right. And Avengers, yeah, you know, the Marvel, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's he only does franchises. <laughs> I can't believe there's not like a Pulp Fiction five out there somewhere now. Yeah, well, but see, that's what's so interesting about Sam is there are for for most actors at his level, mm -hmm. you know, they are not in super popular franchises. Yeah, like Robert De Niro ain't in no Marvel movies. No, uh, uh. But Sam's no. at that same level. And also at that same level of success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he bought the block that Robert De Niro lives on and <laughs> yeah. said, shuttle your ass on down the street. Yeah. <laughs> I would actually, I, I wish that was true, actually. That would be fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's starting to change with the superhero movies now, though. Like, the, the they're getting bigger and bigger actors in it. And mm -hmm. I remember, you know, like, not too long ago, it was kind of like taboo for big actors, yeah. you know. Like, right to really do those superhero movies. But then I guess they got the funds and they can't say no or... Well, yeah, now I think, you know, a lot of the big actors have stopped listening to Martin Scorsese. It's like, no, no, these are actually good movies, Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, and the fact that, I mean, I think in the beginning, there, you know, especially with some of those DC movies, except for Superman and the first Batman, yes. there weren't a lot of real quality acting in it. I agree. Yeah. It's just like, no, no, I was just making a comic book movie. Yeah. Put yeah. the colors in. Yeah. yeah. But now they've got a higher level yeah. of quality. Yeah, I agree. Oh, for sure. So you feel these characters. Like I said before, they're not just playing the suits no more. Yeah. They're playing that's the right. people. Yeah, that's right. Boy, that's so true. What's your thoughts on the idea of, some people say, you know, the actors aren't famous, the characters are in these Marvel mm -hmm. films. Do you believe in that Well, he's mindset? famous. So the hell with those people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the actors aren't famous, the characters. Well, see... The, the tricky thing there is to who? Yeah. Because those characters are famous for a certain mm -hmm. you know, group of us comic oh, yeah. book nerds. Yeah. You know? But for a lot of the mainstream people, at least in the beginning, I think that's actually the reason that Marvel was able to jump off mm -hmm. so well. Because they started with one of their B-list heroes not one of their a-list mm -hmm. so that they could transform it and make it the kind the version of the character mm -hmm. that worked best in the movie like when you do iron like when he did iron man when john favreau did iron man mm -hmm. yeah most people in mainstream cult, american culture they didn't know nothing about iron man oh wow yeah. but if iron man had been superman or batman yeah even the people who didn't read comic books would have an opinion mm -hmm. no no you can't give him that kind of goatee yeah, and I love those movies, by the way, the yeah. Iron Man movies. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Marvel makes a, uh, I mean, what was, you're talking about, uh, that was the first one, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so, too. And I remember seeing him flying through the sky, then all of a sudden, it hits the afterburner, <laughs> and then he just vanished, and I go, okay, I'm going to go see that. <laughs> I, I'm going to go see that, because it looked like the comic books were drawn. They drew the comic book. Yeah. I was like, oh, hell yes. Well, and, and I mean... Favreau was genius in that yeah. he wasn't like trying to make it just like 
a filmed version of the comic book. He took the good stuff from the comics, mm-hmm. the action, the yeah. designs, but he shifted. You know, he gave us this sense of this, mm-hmm. you know, guy. Yeah. This rich guy, but also the technology. Well, if Tony Stark is a tech person, let's do like that whole thing where the yeah. robots. Oh, his, yes, yeah, are, absolutely. Know, are doing things like you never saw that in a comic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But that works better in a movie. Yeah. Like in a comic book, if you were just to draw a machine mm-hmm. that ha- it's like, no, I don't. It doesn't have yeah, any expression. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But on film, you can give it a feel. And I remember thinking, oh boy, the times have changed because when I first started reading it, he, he it wasn't the war in Afghanistan. It was yes. Vietnam. Yes. It was in Vietnam that that happened. And, and he uh, shifted it. Yeah, and it, you got to keep up with the times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to shift bad guys, you know. <laughs> well, and also, I mean, when you adapt something from one you know, medium to another, mm-hmm. you got to make changes. Oh, yeah. You know, you can't just... No, I'm going to do it exact. I'm going to just film the blocks, you know, the panels from the comic. No. Yeah. You know, right. the, the comic book is not, you know, yeah. the the sketch. So, he adapted it. Mm-hmm. You know, just like a novel. You bet. You don't make sure the scene is as long as it takes me to read it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it'd be a weeks long for me. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. He did the same thing with Mandalorian as well as he was able to take something that that took elements that the hardcore Star Wars fans would love and also things that just a mainstream audience would love and combine them because for a while there after those sequels came out for Star Wars people were sort of going eh not really, wasn't really sold on those but when Mandalorian came out yes. it was like yeah. unbelievable and who would have thought a show about a Mandalorian would take off like it did right mm-hmm. well I mean it's again back to John Favreau exactly know, yeah. but also with Dave Filoni Dave Filoni yeah because yeah. they with the Mandalorian I felt like they relaunched Star mm-hmm. Wars, yeah, like the way the original yeah. movie did. I agree, mm-hmm. and it's I think it's because they approached that series very similar to the way George approached the first movie. Like yeah. he was thinking about those, you know, movies he had grown up watching. You know, and he it's like, okay, but now I'm going to put it in space. Mm-hmm. You know, those cliffhangers. Yeah, you know, he did a space version of that. But for the Mandalorian, they had this. They did a space version of a 60s classic western and you know it yeah, sort of know. felt that way because it, you, everything in there felt genuine yes it you know the props and the you know the the mm-hmm. street light was broken you know stuff like that i mean you know there's rust on this thing over there mm-hmm. and that that's that's how it would be you know yeah. out there in the desert getting pounded by the sand and everything and and i just thought the idea of uh, the mandalorian always wearing the hat was good and then right. they took it off and then i, I thought Okay, so he's not like uh, then. He, now he's human, right, right? You know, he wasn't the guy on behind the thing. You know yeah. that guy, whatever. Yeah, it, it, stroke of genius, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I have a, I have a interesting Mandalorian story that I guess I yeah. can tell now. Yes, uh, you can. For a while, I couldn't. Um, but when they were first developing it, because um, one of the new things they were doing was taking. Favreau's um, uh, technology from Lion King, mm-hmm. where he had the digital CG backgrounds, yeah. but they were going to use that for live action. Mm-hmm. You know, so instead of having to fly to the Middle East, mm-hmm. you know, for Tatooine, they could build it digitally. And yeah, shoot the, they shoot did that the, with the last Jungle Book, right? Yeah, oh, Jungle Book, Jungle Book, not Lion that, King. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're talking about the volume, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Shooting it in a volume, and so as a sort of um, proof to the executives to show them how great this was going to mm-hmm. be, mm-hmm. they had to do um, a um, semi-animated version mm. of the first couple of episodes. Mm-hmm. And so they brought a handful of us voice actors mm. in to help them do that. Mm. They had like the first couple of scripts and they said, hey guys, can you just voice this? We're going to do a little rough animation but use the actual backgrounds. So I flew up to Lucasfilm and voiced the Mandalorian. Oh, baby. Wow. Wow is right. And Double uh, wow. And it was amazing because uh, I remember there was another session where we were doing it and they brought D. Baker in mm-hmm. to voice that little like pig-faced alien character. Oh, right, that in, that right. In the actual yes. episode wound up being voiced by Nick Nolte. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah. But, you know, they were thinking at the times like, well, 
we're not going to, we're going to just have him speak in his alien language and, you know, have the dialogue, you know, subtitles underneath mm -hmm. him. So I'm in this booth, you know, playing, voicing the Mandalorian and D is doing this. He's making stuff, up yeah. an alien language. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, with, like with this yes, big, this big yes. alien. And it's like, okay, D in this next scene, he's meeting with these Jawas. So he's speaking Jaw. So then he's, Speaking Jawa with his pig alien accent, and I just oh, remember man. going, oh. "Yeah, yeah, that's cool." How the hell does somebody do that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah, he was incredible. Yeah, and did they any of that get hit? See the light of day? Was it? Did it make no, no, the cut? No, no, it was just to show. It was just for the animated. They yeah. got rid of all that stuff just oh, to show cool. them how the would look. Yeah. So, did you know about the Baby Yoda thing, or was that not part of that? Uh, no, no, I didn't know about no. that. Until after, because okay. you no, know, because they didn't show us the entire thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that was that was an amazing thing that they put into it. Wow. You know. Yeah. Actually, no kidding. I, I I bet you, when George watched, it, he's like, "Oh damn it! I wish I had done that in '77. <laughs> uh -huh. I would have saw twelve times more toys." Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, boy, you see that little guy everywhere, don't you? Right. Oh yeah. I, I go to these cons and, well, what do you, how do you like my little bit? And there's a tattoo of the little guy and I go, oh, that's great. Right? I mean, ooh, okay. Yeah. Do you ever have a lot of people, have, have you ever come up to you and showed you a tattoo of your character um, here and there? Any given character? I Well, actually, I see a lot of Futurama tattoos. Yes. So yeah, and yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. It, it's usually, you know, probably of a Planet Express ship or, yeah, or okay. Bender or something. Yeah, that's true. Um, I actually, I'm trying to remember if anybody has ever had a Hermes, maybe just a Hermes wig. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody, you've got your, you've got your uh, walking orders now. We more Hermes, <laughs> more Phil Lamar tattoos out here, please. Although, have you ever had a, um, an experience at a con where the fans taught you a, you know, a catchphrase? Oh, because I remember. Like, you know, we've, we've been doing Futurama for a while, mm -hmm. but somebody said, hey, can, can you, I don't, can, when you're signing that, can you do that great phrase you do? Like, what, sweet lion or something? No, no, my man witch. Like, <laughs> whoa. Oh, I forgot I said that in episode once. Oh. But then I realized that everybody considered that something that, that's Hermes's catchphrase. I'm like, it is? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 It is. Okay. Not the rhyming ones? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, well, yeah I would think. <laughs> My manwich. Everybody <laughs> wants that sign. That's funny. My yeah. manwich. Although occasionally somebody will come up to the table with a can of manwich. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Can you sign this? I was thinking that's a real thing, isn't it? <laughs> right. Kind of like Sloppy Joe's or something. It's like, all right, I'll sign it, but make sure you eat it before it's a thousand years old. <laughs> yes. No kidding. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well, this seems like a good segue. Uh, we like to do this thing on Jim's podcast where oh. we trade trade voices and trade lines. Would you be willing to do that? So oh. he'll feed you a line of one of his characters. You say oh, it in, wow. in one of your character's voices and <laughs> vice versa. Okay. Okay. Well, how about, should I start with Darkwing? Yeah. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the terror that flaps in the night. Oh, man, that's good. <laughs> that's wicked good. <laughs> Okay, now so you're don't turn. slap me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so don't slap me. <laughs> there we go. Oh, don't try this at home, kids. We need we need to get we need to get a samurai jack one in there somewhere as well. No matter where you go, there you are. So keep on bouncing. No matter where you go, there you are. So keep on the bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfectly in character yeah oh man that's great uh, I, I, and I have to hear Winnie the Pooh scream my man witch ah! yeah <laughs> my man witch <laughs> with a little honey <gasps> get that bear out of here before Zoidberg tries to eat him yeah <laughs> good night everybody <laughs> it's not a gummy bear Zoidberg get away <laughs> he's not a gummy anything <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh man, can we just touch on can we just touch on Clone Wars before we we wrap up? Because you know you both have been in Clone Wars with Hondo and Kit Fisto. Because Kit is such he's like the coolest Jedi, don't you think? Yes, Kit Fisto is the one that shows you that 
even a Jedi can smile. <laughs> <laughs> or even sometimes take off your shirt. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, man. And he's uh, he, Clone Wars or? Oh, no. Uh, Kit was in Clone Wars. Okay, good. Uh, in, in Rebels, I uh, yes. voiced Bail or- Senator Bail Organa. Because apparently Jimmy Smith is a little busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I voted for you for, for Senator. Did you, grow up, did you grow up a Star Wars fan, Phil? Oh, yes. Yes. And to finally be able to play a Jedi after mm. watching the first Star Wars movie at oh, 10. Yeah. yeah. That was such a dream come true. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I just being involved with it in, yeah. as a hubcap would, would be fine with me. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't yeah. agree more. It's something to be really proud of, you know. Yeah, well, of course, I remember that time I worked with George Lucas, <laughs> my close personal friend, George. <laughs> Hand me the uh, salt, will you? <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Yeah, that works. Oh, that's good stuff, man. Well, nice. thank you so very much for being here. Thank you. For I'm me so too, man. so you, so happy. Oh my gosh, Phil Lamar, everybody. In, in, any, any parting questions, phrases, or because we're going to keep this guy and he's, get him in trouble with the wife? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that was Tuned In with Jim Cummings. Thank you for joining us for another episode with Phil Lamar. Pleasure to have you. And don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube. You can find us on Patreon for bonus content and additional watch alongs. And of course, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. Thank you so much for tuning in with Jim Cummings. 